Now, how many of you know that you are all destined to succeed? Amen. There's not a failure in the room if you know the Lord. In spite of uh, what we see in our natural lives and the so-called struggles that we have, there's not a failure in the room. But we have a problem identifying with Christ. And we have a lot of traditional thinking, you know, that really hangs us up over time. That we're not even aware uh, that it's not in sync with what's on God's mind concerning you. And that's why we're here, you know, to bring to bear on your consciousness what is in your spirit that at this time has not been able to surface because of the, the deep overlay of carnality and traditions of men, old habits, Things that choke the word. Yes. <coughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now I want to ask you a question. I want you to be honest with me now. You going to be honest with me this morning? Yes. All right, because if you be honest, you will get free. How many of you in here are sick, but you believe in God for your healing. Let me see your hand. Raise your hand so I can see it. Wave it at me, you know, like this. All right. Now, let me help you. That's the reason why you're sick. Now, this is, this is, this was not designed to embarrass you. It, it was designed to, to uh, enlighten you. You see, if you're sick and you believe in God for your healing, you can have a hard time getting it. What, what I'm sharing with you has everything to do with how you identify with Christ. You, you see, you're not sick, you're healed. Amen. You are the healed, yes. believe in God for the manifestation Amen. of what you are because you can't get what you don't have. Amen. That's true. So if you're sick, then there is no deliverance in sickness. But if you're healed, and you're under attack, there's deliverance because of what you already are. Now, this will help you to change the platform from which you believe God. So in order for this to work for you, you have got to change your position you got to change your, your process of the way you think about yourself. You are, in reality, the healed. Because Jesus bore our sicknesses, carried our diseases on the cross. He was wounded for our transgressions and bruised for our iniquities. And the chastisement of our peace was upon him. Him. And with his stripes, we were, we were healed, and if we were, we are. So if I'm healed, I can't be healed and sick. Now listen to me very carefully now. Your body it's a fact that your body can be under the attack of sickness. But what do you embrace? Do you embrace the fact that I'm sick? Or do you embrace the reality that I'm the healed? Come on now. And that's got to match 
with what you say about yourself. And that little quiz that I just gave you was just proof, proof positive that you are relaxed in that area of your process of thinking. You are relaxed there, and what you have done, you have perceived yourself through your senses instead of perceiving yourself through the word. That's why it was so easy for you when I asked you how many of you are sick and believe in God for your healing. That's why it was so easy for you to raise your hand and say, I'm sick. So you, you gave an admission that you are not healed. Aren't you glad that the, the Lord spoke that to you this morning? Amen. Because now you can do what? You can fix it. Amen. You can fix it now. So your body comes under attack with a sickness and disease. That's not who you are. That's what you're dealing with. But that's not who you are. You are the healed battling the sickness that has attached itself to your body. Because if you're the sick, there is no remedy for you battling from a sick perspective. You're going to need an intercessor, an intercessor to help you if that's the case. You say, that's just a play on words. No, it's not a play on words. It's a fact versus truth. Now, you're either going to live in fact or you're going to live in truth. You got to determine that. And whichever one you choose, that's the one you're going to give authority to through your words. And that's what's going to manifest in your life. All right, now. This is a critical thing, people. It is. You know, we've been so relaxed in our speech and, it's, and, and calling facts truth so much because they are evident to the five physical senses because you've not moved over into the realm of the spirit to see what real truth is. Jesus said, my word is truth. And you've heard me make this statement. You know, we got to find out what's on God's mind concerning us. You've heard me say that many times, right? Well, see, that is profound in the sense that if God said something about you, that's what he is. That's as much as what is truth as when he spoke creation into existence. The Bible says he said, let this be, and it was. He said, let this be, and it was. Let this be, and it was. You read Genesis 1 all the way down to verse 25, 24 and 25, and you will see that whatever God said, it was. Because he spoke it. Now, listen to this. If what God says about himself in the word of God is true, how many of you agree with that? Everything God said about himself in his word is absolute truth. How many of you agree with that? Amen. Then that's the same God talking about you. Amen. And so if everything he said about himself is true, everything he said about you is true. Amen. Now, you got to go back and deal with that. Because there's no other way that you are going to evolve into the express image of Christ unless you can identify with what God has already said about you. Now, identification means An exact replica. 
an exact duplication So there are a couple of other things, you know, that I'll talk about in just a minute if, if I have time. But we need to just get that down inside of our spirit and renew our mind with that because that's the beginning of mind renewal. The beginning of mind renewal is accepting your identification with Christ without Accepting your identification with Christ, you can't renew your mind. And that's one of the reasons why we see so many Christians still teeter-tottering between the truth and religion because they have a problem starting out identifying with Christ. See, when you first got born again, the first thing that you were supposed to begin to study about yourself was how you and Christ Jesus were the same. Did you hear what I said? But see, you didn't start out believing that you and Jesus were the same. And that's where you made your first mistake. So now we got to go back and retrain ourselves to accept the miracle of the new birth. And the miracle of the new birth was that God made you just like Jesus. So then that's going to change the way you study the word of God from here on out. Because now you're going to begin to study the, the word of God to discover yourself. And how much you are just like God. So then when you read the Gospels now and you see the ministry of Jesus, you're going to begin to see how you're supposed to act instead of reading the story of what Jesus did. It's, it's kind of like uh, when you watch HGTV and you watch the DIY. You're not watching it to see what they did you're watching to see what you can do. So you're studying their movements and their equipment and everything because guess what you're going to do? You're going to duplicate what they did. In other words, you're going to identify with them. You're going to buy the same kind of saw. You're going to buy the same kind of wood. You're going to buy the same kind of vacuum. You're going to buy, buy the same kind of whatever, gloves, glasses for protection. You're going to buy all that stuff because you're going to identify with them. And guess what you expect to get? The same results. Because you went after it identifying with them. Not watching what they could do like we have done for years when we read the Bible and we look at what Jesus did. We're just reading what Jesus could do. And we get in awe, we tell the stories about what Jesus can do. And people get all excited, shouting, running and screaming and hollering about, oh, how wonderful Jesus is, how powerful Jesus is. Oh, what a wonderful Savior he is. And all that's true. But if you gave Jesus all that credit and then after you give him all that credit you tell him but that ain't nothing I can do he would have done all that he did going to the cross resurrecting from the dead taking all the shame and, and ridicule that he did for nothing that's no different than if the person that's teaching you how to build a house take you through all these classes, teach you all about the wood and the nails and the, and the other apparatus and stuff, the foundation and how to pitch the roof and, and all that kind of stuff. And then you tell him, but that ain't nothing that I can do. Then he has wasted his time. Now, how many of you has Jesus wasted his time? 
Now, he didn't waste his time on everybody because there are a lot of people that took him at his word and have been transformed into the express image of Christ, the express image of Christ. But, then, but how many of you did he waste his time going to the cross, going into hell for three days and nights and resurrecting? How many of you did he do it for nothing? That's the question. Now you can fix that. I don't care how lax the days ago you've been over the years, how non-productive you've been, you can change your mind today and say, that's it. How many of you still here? Amen. So we have to identify with Christ. Now, let me ask you a question. Uh, how many of you got a driver's license? How many of you got a driver's license? What do they call your driver's license? ID. ID. Whose picture is on it? Uh, whose birth date is on it? Whose weight is on it? I don't know about that. <laughs> I don't know about that one. A, a weight. Then that might not be you then. We, we're going to have to get the FBI to check you out, but that might not be you, because all of the, the stuff on it don't match. <laughs> but you get where I'm coming from, right? That's why uh, the state recognizes it as valid, because it's identical to you. And that's what identification is. It's identical. You get ready are identical to Jesus. Oh, you saying oh amen, but let's see. You are identical to Jesus. And I'm going to tell you why you had to be made identical to Jesus, because Jesus is the prototype for the kind of, of people that God intended for the earth to be full of in the beginning, when he made Adam. That's why Adam is the type. And Jesus was named the last, what? Adam, because of the type. Because God, in the beginning, intended for the earth be, to be overrun with his children, children that had his DNA, that had all of his characteristics. You see, I'm, I'm, I'm sharing with you things that you need to bring to bear on your thought processes so you can concentrate on them so that you can get a revelation of who you are. Without a revelation of who you are, you're going to be scrambling in this life. I'm telling you, you're going to live defeated. You might be born again, but you're going to live like you don't have no God. Let alone God living on the inside of you is the reason why you have to have a revelation. Your success does not begin until you get a revelation. And in order to get a revelation, you got to have a relationship. You've got to have a more intimate relationship in order to know a person. Amen. 
you don't really know your spouse until you get intimate with them. You know of them, but you don't know them. Because through the intimate process, we yield everything that we are. They yield everything that they are. And there is a transfer that takes place in intimacy. You become me and I become you. And we become one. So there's no longer two. Intimacy has made us one. I mean, it's all over the Bible, man. How many of you read the Bible every day? Well, these things uh, should not be foreign to you that I'm speaking. Uh, you're still on discovery, and you should be. And you're going to read the same scripture 400 times, and you're going to discover something new. But we got to identify with Christ. Now, in Romans 12, it talks about us not conforming to this world. That's Romans 12 too. But being transformed by renewing our minds and it wants us to renew our minds it says, and be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you might prove. And that proof has everything to do with demonstration. Because without demonstration, there is no proof. You can't prove anything that you can't do. If you say I'm a concert pianist, then I should set you behind a piano and you should play Bach or Chopin or somebody. Because you're a concert pianist. And, and we know, uh, you know, that that's what they do. You ought to be able to prove it. So, if we don't conform ourselves to this world, we got to conform ourselves to something. That is the identification with Christ. See, you have got to conform to that because look, it ain't but so many hours in a day. Pastor Diana was talking about that up here just a minute ago. There ain't but so many hours in a day. Now, she made a statement and I heard y'all going, uh, uh. You see, if you knew Jesus was coming back next year, this time, this date, and you knew for an assurance that he was going to show up, what would your life be like between now and then? Then what you would do, you would begin to make reassessment of your scheduling, first of all. First thing you do is say, no, no, I can't be wasting no time. So I ain't going back to, the, to see that movie no more because that was three hours long. I ain't going to waste my time <laughs> going to no more movies. I ain't going out to eat no more because that take another three or four hours. I could be studying the word of God. I could be praying. I could go next door to my neighbor and lay hands on them. There's a whole lot of things that you could figure to do with the time that you do now. You say all, all the vacations are out. Don't nobody ask me to go on no vacation because I ain't going on no vacation. I ain't, I ain't got but, but 365 days to get this thing right. Come on. And I ain't going to waste no time doing a whole lot of stuff that's not really necessary. It's just stuff I like to do but it's not productive for the kingdom of God's sake. You will begin to assess all that. You wouldn't spend half as much time on the phone as you do. Amen. Surfing through the phone, you know, because that, that take about seven hours of the day for the average person. 
that's got a phone. You don't sit, you don't sleep, you don't drive without that phone. That phone and you are one. And if for some reason you couldn't find it, you had to take some medication <laughs> to fix the shakes and the tremor that you would get because I can't find my phone. I got everything in that phone. That phone tell me when it's time to eat, when it's time to sleep. As a matter of fact, that's one of your greatest expenses is your phone. You got every app on it that ever apped. <laughs> you, because you need to be accessible to the world wide web and everything on it. And without it, I'm incomplete. Now, I've granted that it's got some advantages, but if you didn't have your phone, you couldn't handle a phone book. If you didn't have that phone, you wouldn't be able to handle a, a phone with a dial on it that you had to <laughs> stick your finger in the hole and spin it. <laughs> Let me just think of how you've graduated you know, into all this technology and everything, and, and you act like the, uh, the phone is your salvation. You said it can't spell without a phone, because what, what the phone do? Spell check. So you, you, can, you can talk backwards and it'll put it forward for you. And the people on the other end think you're a scholar. And you can't spell it. I mean, sometimes you, you, your mind gets shifted. I, I, I remember one time, I forgot how to spell is. I mean, just for a brief moment, it's just some fog we got up in there or something. And I was writing and I was trying to figure out how to spell is. But I, I came back to myself. But you would, you would trim down a lot of activity if you knew Jesus was coming back 365 days from that day. You would, you would do it voluntarily. You would, you would put your body under and you would keep it under. You'd be hitting yourself all upside the head all day long based on the thoughts that would be coming in your mind. You'd be saying, I ain't got time to think about that. You be casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. I'll tell you what you do. You remember more scripture than you ever remembered in your life. You, you'd have a, a regimen of time. You say, well, 15 minutes in the morning, I'm going to memorize that. 15 minutes at lunch, I'm going to memorize that. 15 minutes at dinner, I'm going to memorize that. A whole lot of your time will be spent trying to understand the Bible. When you got time right now. So then identifying with Christ, people, is the beginning of mind renewal. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you might prove what is the good, the acceptable, and the perfect will of God. Romans 12, 2. You got to get in this Bible for yourself. How many of you got a Bible at home? I ain't talking about on your phone. I'm talking about a real Bible. You need a paper Bible and a marker so you can mark through stuff and you can rehearse it. 
I ain't talking about on your phone. A lot of you try to get so streamlined and so automated, you go to church with a phone and try to follow the pastor with a phone because the Bible is on your phone. Hey, come on, man. I'm trying to take you back to the beginning. <laughs> I ain't against automation, but it's just something about a, a Bible with pages in it. And, and flipping through the pages and, and see where you have marked and everything. I got a Bible at home that I studied so much I done rubbed the words off the page. <laughs> the words are no longer on the page. Only thing on the page is my thumbprints. I've actually torn the pages from turning them so much. My son said he want that Bible when I leave and transition and go to be with the dog. I might take that Bible with me though. <laughs> How do you see in the necessity of identifying with Christ? Okay, now. How much time I got, son? Okay. Let me see what I can give you in eight minutes. Turn your Bible to uh, Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, look at verse, uh, verse 10. And you have it? Say, I have it. I have it. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works which God had before ordained that we should walk in them. See, God, God created us for this exact purpose. And he put everything in us that he put in Christ. Everything that was in Christ, when he, when he fashioned us, he put everything in us that he had in Christ. Because that's the only way that we could be in Christ it. I know that's not a, 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 a word, Christ it, but you get my drift. Let me, let me say this about... Uh, one, one theologian said that the, the, the true uh, revelation of the, the word of God or the New Testament is in the prepositions. Mm -hmm. yeah. I heard a man of God say that, that it's in the prepositions because the prepositions are the connecting words. In Christ, in whom, for, through, by. These words connect us to Christ. And when we go through the scriptures, you'll see these in Christ, uh, these things pointing to how we identify with Christ about a hundred and 60 times in the New Testament. As a matter of fact, one theologian said that the, the, the letters that Paul wrote to the churches was the revelation of his encounter with Christ. And what he is doing, he is sharing with all the churches what they can look forward to as they identify with Christ. Let's, let's look uh, briefly at Ephesians chapter 1. And I, I read some of it to you. 
already, but I want to get down here to verse 16. When you have it, say I have it. Hallelujah. Well, I'll start at 15. Wherefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and the love to all the saints, cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. Now, now a lot of times, you know, we got to look at this in, in conjunction with why Paul wrote it. See, you can actually pray this as a prayer for yourself. And you should pray this every day for yourself. Because encapsulated in this is a revelation of all that God had done for us. And we need to pray that out. Because without this revelation, then you're not going to see how you identify with the Lord Jesus Christ. It says in verse 17, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. You see, that's a big load, man. Can you imagine uh, how you would think and how you would talk if you had the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of God? You see, that's what happened to Paul. The Holy Ghost gave him a revelation of God and who God is unto him and who he is unto God and who Jesus is and how he related to Jesus at his conversion. See, a whole lot more happened to Paul when he got knocked off that horse on the road to Damascus. Something changed inside of him that was so evident that he recognized that he was not the same person. Paul recognized that he was not the same person. And he wrote about it in in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Listen to this. He said, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened. That's big time. The eyes of your understanding. You know what that is? The eyes in your spirit. See, that's what happened with uh, Elisha and Gehazi. When, when Gehazi, uh, you, know, you, you, understand, you know that story about Gehazi. And, and the, the armies of Syria and all that kind of stuff, and how that, that Elisha told God, open his eyes so he can see what I see. See, it didn't have to be a, a tangible vision for Elisha because the eyes of his understanding were enlightened about who he was and who he was unto God and all that God had done for him and was doing for him to preserve him to do the will of God. But he had to ask God to open Gehazi's eyes of his understanding. And he got a revelation of the angelic forces encamped about him and Elisha. God let him look in the spirit. Well, see, you and I can look in the spirit every day. Man, we got some things going on that we've not taken advantage of. He said, as you understand and being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling. See, we're supposed to be able to look into that realm that you heard me talk about, the realm of hope. Because that's where everything is. That's where the beginning and the end of your life and your victory is, 
in that realm. And you're supposed to be able to look in there and stabilize yourself. When hard times come in the natural realm and your flesh get under attack or your finances get under attack, you're supposed to be able to see by the enlightenment of the word of God in your heart and you're supposed to see what the, what the real end going to be. And then you're not supposed to fret because you already know what is the hope of his calling. God Almighty. Woo! Man shucks. Let me tell you something. You get a hold of this, there ain't many people going to be able to hang out with you. Let me tell you, folk ain't going to be in such a hurry to hang out with you because they're going to say, that guy's strange, man. You better believe I'm strange because I'm from another planet. I'm an alien down here. And I can call home just like E.T. Man, if you ever get a revelation of who you really are, you need to look in the mirror and ask yourself, who in the world are you? Man, you're wasting the better part of your life consuming yourself with all this earthly stuff that you deal with, all these earthly schedules that you got to keep. You're wasting the better part of your life. It's only 24 hours in a day. And how many of those hours is reserved for Christ? But Pastor, I got to go to work. Go to work in Christ. You don't have to stop being a Christian to go to work. As a matter of fact, they need you being a Christian on that job with all those heathens around you cussing and swearing. They need you to come out of that corner of that being a little mouse in the corner. I heard a guy on television the other day say, yeah, he was quiet as a church mouse. A quiet as a, a poor as a church mouse. I said, man, ain't that something? They had an equated Christians as mice that, that's, that don't want to be identified. You know, when you see a mouse, what are you doing? He running, trying to get to a hole so that he don't have to account for his presence. And that's the way a lot of Christians do. You be in the midst of the world and you're just the quietest thing in the room. Even when an issue come up that you can defend with the gospel, you keep your mouth shut. And I'm out of time. Did you learn anything? Hallelujah.